This video is brought to you by Brilliant. You're going to learn more about Brilliant later in today's video, but if you'd like to learn more about them right now, go to brilliant.org forward slash biographics. You'll also find a link in the description below. Benjamin Franklin was one of the founding fathers of the United States of America. You probably knew that one. Every single American has been taught the stories of his accomplishments since elementary school, and it's hard to go anywhere in the U.S. without eventually being reminded of Ben Franklin. In Philadelphia, there's the Ben Franklin Bridge, Franklin Institute, and statues of his likeness all over the city. His face is also on the $100 bill. There was so much respect for him in the United States that saying anything negative is practically treasonous. But on today's biographies, we're not going to hold back on all of the details about how Ben Franklin was a bit of a mad lad. Benjamin Franklin was born on January the 17th, 1706, in Boston, Massachusetts. His father, Josiah Franklin, came to the colonies in 1682 from Northamptonshire, and he made candles and soap for a living. Josiah Franklin fathered 16 children. He had seven with his first wife and child in England, and nine with his second wife, Abaya Folger, once he came to America. As you can imagine, raising 17 children on a candlemaker's salary was not easy. Money was incredibly tight in their household. Ben Franklin went to grammar school for just two years because he had to leave to work in his father's candle business. Ben Franklin's parents were so poor, they sold him into indentured servitude to their oldest son, James. In case you weren't aware of how indentured servitude works, Ben Franklin was an unpaid slave to his own brother until his labor repaid the debt. James had started his own printmaking business and published a newspaper called The New England Current. Ben's free room and board also counted against him. For most of his younger years, he was not allowed to earn an income. Franklin tried to earn money by starting a side hustle. He used the printers to self-publish his writing. Then he would stand in the middle of the streets and recite his ballads and his poems out loud, trying to sell paper copies to people who passed by. However, he was a novice without a proper education, so this never really made enough income to support him. Franklin then tried to get married at age 19 to a woman named Deborah Reed. At the time when a man got married, they received a dowry from the woman's father, which would have helped him pay off his debt. At first, he thought he could live together with Reed's parents, but once her father found out that Franklin was an indentured servant, he retracted his permission for the two of them to marry. After rejecting Ben Franklin, Deborah Reed's parents arranged a marriage for her to a man named John Rogers. However, it turns out that Franklin wasn't the only one who was eyeing Deborah's dowry. Rogers lied about having a job, and he was actually unemployed. He spent all the money and got them both into a massive amount of debt. One of John Rogers' friends from England came to visit and was shocked to see that he had a wife because he was already legally married back in the UK. After being exposed, John Rogers jumped on the next boat back to England. Obviously, this was a disaster and Deborah Reed could not get a divorce because he wasn't around to sign the paperwork. Meanwhile, Ben Franklin was enjoying his life as a bachelor. In his autobiography, he wrote about what sounds like a sex addiction. The hard-to-be-governed passion of my youth had hurried me frequently into intrigues with low women that fell in my way. By the time Ben Franklin and Deborah Reed reunited, he had gotten another woman pregnant out of wedlock. He showed up with a baby who he called William. No one knows the identity of this mystery woman or why she abandoned their child. Deborah Reed, though, was just happy to have Franklin back, and she agreed to help raise William. Since Reed never got a divorce, they could not get legally married. They went on to have two more children together and live as common-law husband and wife. Once Franklin completed his sentence of servitude, it only made sense for him to take everything he learned from his brother James and open up his own printing business. In order to accomplish that, he had to travel to England to purchase expensive printing equipment and sail back to Boston. Franklin was still broke, but he was able to get an investor to help with the startup costs. However, once he was in London, his investor backed out, leaving him stranded. Franklin managed to get back to the United States, but he decided to leave Boston in favor of Philadelphia. He began printing the Pennsylvania Gazette in 1728. He didn't waste any time making friends and joined a club called the Junto Club. Together they established a library, similar to what was already available to the public back in England. Even though the Junto Club was already getting this project together, Franklin would often claim that he was the first one to create a library in the United States all by himself. That lie has been circulated so many times that it has even found its way into history books. Another one of the achievements that Ben Franklin is mistakenly credited with is publishing the first almanac in the United States. 
His Poor Richard's Almanac premiered in 1733, and it became the second most printed book besides the Bible. However, he actually stole this idea and took all of the credit. Again. The Leeds family of New Jersey had been publishing a farmer's almanac since 1689, which was 17 years before Ben Franklin was even born. Franklin saw that their business was thriving, and he decided that he wanted to steal the business model. But the Leeds family was already far more established and popular than he was. Young Franklin didn't stand a chance, that is, until he decided to destroy the family's reputation. Ben Franklin began a rumor that the family's patriarch, Titan Leeds, was a Satanist, and he published a prediction that he would die in 1733. Franklin also went on to publish more defamatory stories about the Leeds family in the Philadelphia Gazette. Just two years later, in 1735, a story spread that Mother Leeds gave birth to a hideous demonic creature called the Jersey Devil. This permanently ruined the family's reputation to the point where the family business could not recover. So now you might be wondering, well, why didn't the Leeds family just sue the hell out of Ben Franklin? Well, right around the same time, the US courts had decided that newspapers and print publications should have freedom of speech, even if the words they printed could not be proven to be true. This idea is what eventually developed into the First Amendment of the US Constitution. Journalists were put on a pedestal of having a high degree of ethics, and most people trusted that they would do their due diligence before publishing a story. Just a few years later, in 1737, Ben Franklin got the job as Postmaster General of Philadelphia. The postal system in the colonies was already run by the British Crown Post. It was common for the major newspaper publishers of each city to be in charge of the mail, since they were already delivering papers to subscribers. According to the historic records from the US Postal Service, Franklin could choose to not deliver any competing newspapers. This essentially gave him a monopoly over information being sent throughout Philadelphia. Keep in mind that at the time, Philadelphia was the largest city, and it was also the nation's capital. With this tremendous amount of power, he could make people believe anything he wanted. Now, just before we get into some of Franklin's less than original inventions, let me tell you a bit about Brilliant. Brilliant are a science learning platform that allow you to learn through active learning, which summed up is basically the opposite of that feeling of reading a complex paragraph about some principle and then just have no idea what's going on even when you've read it 10 times and it's still just a blur and you don't even remember what you read. Active learning is the opposite of that and that's what Brilliant is about. Basically, they give you a short paragraph to read, a concept for you to grasp, and then they give you a question on it immediately afterwards. So you're applying that knowledge immediately, and this is an incredibly effective way to learn. Now, you've heard me talk about Brilliant a bunch. They've got lots of cool stuff on there. They've got these daily challenges where every day you can take five minutes to just go through a question. This is perfect if you're busy, if you're someone like me, you don't have a ton of time every day to sit down and do something, but you can take five minutes a day on your commute to work or whatever and just do a quick daily challenge. It's that, again, bit of information, quick question underneath, and you can just whip through one of those, and it's a fantastic way to basically grasp a concept that you didn't think you'd be able to grasp. It's a really effective way to learn. Also, speaking of doing these on your commute, Brilliant now have offline mode, so you can get the Brilliant app. You can use it offline so you don't have to use your data or if you've got a spotty internet connection, if you're on a flight, stuff like that, it doesn't matter. So, if you want to support Biographics, which is always good of you, and get unlimited access to all of Brilliant's in-depth maths and science courses, you can head over to brilliant.org forward slash biographics and get 20% off their annual premium subscription. And let's get back to Franklin. You've probably heard that Ben Franklin discovered electricity. As the story goes, he went outside with a key tied to a kite string during a lightning storm. Many modern day historians now believe that this story was a work of fiction. Other scientists were already experimenting with electricity years before he did. Peter Collinson was actually the man who showed Ben Franklin a functional electric tube, which sparked his interest in science. After this point, Franklin began his own experiments with electricity. However, keep in mind that he only had two years of elementary school education and was self-taught through reading books. Unlike Peter Collinson, Franklin had no knowledge of physics. He was so clueless that he published information that electricity was actually a fluid. Despite not really knowing what he was talking about, Ben Franklin made a huge public spectacle about his discovery of electricity. He decided to show how he could stop a turkey's heart with an electric shock because, well, I guess that's not creepy or anything. Then he wanted to go on and cook the entire turkey with electrocution as well. But in the midst of trying to demonstrate this, he actually electrocuted himself and passed out on the floor in front of a crowd of people. Instead of realizing that Ben Franklin was incapacitated, people were still very impressed. 
and this allowed him to develop a reputation of being a scientist. He went on to supposedly invent several other things, like the Franklin stove, which was actually a copy of the design of a fireplace at the Louvre in Paris. And further, the College of Optometrists has serious doubts that he actually invented bifocal eyeglasses. The list of examples goes on and on. The deeper your research, the more you realize that Ben Franklin may not have invented anything, and that all of his ideas most likely came from books and people that he met. He never filed a single patent, never registered any copyright, and in his autobiography, he claimed that he chose not to do this because he was such a great guy and wanted to share these brilliant ideas with the world without profiting. The reality was that if he filed a patent for an idea that wasn't his, he was just asking to get sued. Even though he never made any money from these inventions, Benjamin Franklin was still a successful businessman. By the time he was in his 40s, his employees were running the newspaper without him, and he was able to focus on his position as postmaster general. He would travel around the country for public speaking engagements with members of the British Parliament. When he was 51 years old, Benjamin Franklin moved to England in order to negotiate on behalf of the colonists of Pennsylvania. Franklin spent the next several years living in London with his son William. He began to make friends with members of the British aristocracy. This led him to become a part of a group called the Hellfire Club, which was a secret society of upper-class men who liked to discuss philosophy, politics, and the occult. Members met at empty monasteries and churches to hold black masses and orgies. According to records, the members wore robes similar to monks and tried to perform magic spells. There were 36 separate allegations that Ben Franklin was indeed a part of the Hellfire Club under the code name Brother Benjamin of Cookham. There is also significant evidence in the form of letters written by Franklin that proves he was very good friends with the founder, Sir Francis Dashwood. Despite the overwhelming amount of evidence, many American historians have tried to make up excuses for him and deny his involvement in the club. Ben Franklin's private life was even darker than we can ever imagine. In 1998, a group was attempting to renovate his house in London when they discovered the bones of at least 15 people buried in his basement, John Wayne Gacy style. Hello! Six of those bodies were young children. There was even a baby. The bones showed signs that they had been dissected, with their limbs chopped and drilled to make them easier to carry down into the crawl space. Historians were baffled by this scene that clearly looked like the work of a serial killer. They scrambled to find a rational explanation as to why their beloved founding father would have done this. They then decided to blame it on William Hewson, who was a friend of Franklin's. Hewson was studying blood, and he became known as the father of hematology. At the time, it was illegal for doctors to dissect cadavers because it was considered to be disrespectful, and it went against Christian beliefs in burial rites. But doctors and scientists, they continued to do so in the name of science. There is no documentation proving that this theory about an anatomy school is true, and it is simply speculation. If Hewson was responsible for this, it would still make Ben Franklin complicit in grave robbing. Some historians are quick to jump to Franklin's defense, saying that it's possible that he had no idea that William Hewson had done this, but if we learned anything from the story of John Wayne Gacy, the smell of 15 bodies in the windowless basement would have been an overwhelming scent. So there's probably no way Franklin could have missed that. Benjamin Franklin moved back to the colonies in 1775 during the breakout of the Revolutionary War. His son, William Franklin, publicly announced his loyalty to England and was banished from ever returning to the colonies again, so he continued living in London. Even though he publicly supported the Americas, it would seem that Ben and his son were actually on the same page. Author and historian Richard Deacon wrote a book called A History of the British Secret Service, where he presents compelling evidence that Ben Franklin was working as a double agent number 72. When he returned to the colonies, the Americans believed that he was giving them vital information about England to help in the war effort, but Deacon Deacon discovered that the British archives actually had copies of every single transmission. In reality, Franklin was only telling the Americans what the British wanted them to hear. In 1776, the American Revolutionary War was won, and the British colonies became the United States. The Declaration of Independence it was created by a committee of five men, with Thomas Jefferson being the main writer. According to the Franklin Institute, Ben Franklin's only contribution was to check for spelling errors. Even though he was secretly spying for England, Franklin was happy to take some of the glory. He made his signature on the Declaration of Independence nearly as large and obnoxious as John Hancock's. Just one month later, though, he wanted to move back to Europe. He left the colonies and became the new American ambassador of France.
1777, Ben Franklin began his new life in Paris. At this point, he was a celebrity, and it was well known that he was one of America's founding fathers. The French had helped during the American Revolution, so the excitement of the victory was still in the air. People were also invested in reading the stories about everyone involved. The French Revolution it was only a few years away in 1789. French women thought that these stories they were exciting, and they imagined American men to be brave and heroic. Even at 71 years old, Ben Franklin had no problem impressing the ladies with his stories, and he started living his best life. At this point, he had no longer any filter. He began to earn a reputation for being gluttonous, lecherous, and partying really hard. When John Adams went to visit Franklin in Paris, he came back disgusted by how he was wasting taxpayer dollars on his extravagant new lifestyle. Thomas Jefferson also wrote about Franklin, I have marked him particularly in the company of women where he loses all power over himself and becomes almost frenzied. Even though the Founding Fathers were trying to get Franklin to check himself before he wrecked himself, he responded to all of his haters by writing this poem. So, though I robbed you of a kiss sweeter than the ambrosial dew, why are you so angry at my bliss? Has it all impoverished you? This wild lifestyle it wasn't just reserved for pirate parties, though. Franklin's next-door neighbor was a wealthy businessman named Monsieur Brillon de Joy, and his wife, Madame Brillon, was a famous harpsichord player. Just like many other French women, Madame Brillon thought that Franklin was very impressive, and they began to have an affair. She was in her 30s, and she didn't seem to mind that Franklin was in his 70s. For some strange reason, Franklin thought it was necessary to make Madame Brillon sign a contract on the terms of their affair. Apparently, Monsieur Brillon had absolutely no idea that Franklin was sleeping with his wife because he was invited over to dinner at their house twice a week. There were a countless number of affairs with other women, including the widow of the famous photographer Helvetius and Catherine de Ligneville. His common-law wife, Deborah Reed, had passed away, so he proposed to her. She declined, claiming that she was still in love with her late husband and that she felt it would be disrespectful to his memory. Unfortunately, though, Ben Franklin probably didn't restrain himself until after Deborah's death to have affairs. When he was 39 years old, he wrote a letter to a young man who wanted advice on how to deal with a sex addiction. Franklin recommended that he should start having secret affairs with older women because they were more experienced, discreet, and willing to treat younger men very well. He also mentions that after menopause, there is no hazard of children. When you go through all of the very specific details he gives in that letter, it's obvious that Franklin was speaking from experience. After the other founding fathers saw his true colors, word began to spread that Franklin was actually a lecherous old man. Most people felt that this was acceptable, considering all of his other accomplishments. And of course, he came up with excuses for his poor behavior. In one of his essays, he wrote that he developed a method of trying to see if it was possible for a human being to actually achieve perfection. His list of 13 virtues were as follows. Temperance, silence, order, resolution, frugality, industry, sincerity, justice, moderation, cleanliness, tranquility, and chastity. Franklin claims that he would make attempts to improve his personality only to realize that the harder he tried to be good at one thing, he would begin to lack in other aspects of his life. He concluded that it's not possible for someone to ever be perfect. So if you can't be perfect, why even try to be a good person, right? For the rest of Benjamin Franklin's life, he continued to indulge in whatever he wanted. He eventually contracted a painful condition known as the gout, which usually only happens from drinking too much alcohol and eating the wrong things. During his recovery, he wrote a fake conversation with his disease. Through this, we find out that in his later years, the only exercise he got in a day was the walk from his carriage to a restaurant and then back again. The rest of his time was spent lounging around, drinking tea, eating, reading books, and spending time with the ladies. Benjamin Franklin died at the ripe old age of 84. Contrary to popular belief, he did not have syphilis, which is a miracle considering that he slept with nearly everything that moved. He had pleurisy when he died, which is a disease of the lung. For years after his death, the only evidence that people cared about Ben Franklin's legacy came from his self-published autobiography. They believed everything he said and took his word as gospel. The hero worship of Benjamin Franklin is now ingrained in American history. People want to believe that this genius polymath was one of the masterminds behind the founding of the nation, and, and Americans became proud to have him represent their country. Whether you love him or hate him, there is no denying that he made an impact. Today there are statues, museums, libraries, schools, and entire towns named after Benjamin Franklin in the US. If he were alive to see all this today, he would probably smile, because just like everything else in his life, he got exactly what he wanted. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do give us a thumbs up below and don't forget to subscribe. We've got brand new videos four times a week. Also, please do check out Brilliant. There is a link below. And as always, thank you for watching.